In community prosecution, crime problems are best solved when three different but equally important groups work together, the police, the people, and the prosecutors. I'm one of those prosecutors, but the following does not reflect the views, opinions, or policies of any particular prosecutor's office. These are my stories. <laughs> to paraphrase Mark Twain, the two most important days of my life are the day that I was born and the day I became a community prosecutor. I was born on September 19th, which makes me a Virgo, and by show of hands from the audience, do we have any Virgos? Okay, a few. So you would understand, we tend to be a little bit critical, discerning, and we're perfectionists, but it's only because we want to see and make the world a better place. The men I've dated don't seem to think that's the case. <laughs> they say that nothing or the world will not be ever good enough for me. Speaking of which, Mark Twain actually got it wrong because there was three important days of my life. The third being the day that I started Women Wonder Writers. We'll cut him a break though, because he wasn't a Virgo, he wasn't a prosecutor, and he certainly wasn't a woman. <laughs> see, see how critical I could be? Now, when I was a homicide DA, I had no idea what a community prosecutor was. In fact, most prosecutors around this country have no idea what a community prosecutor does. And community prosecution basically believes that if you have citizens, police, and prosecutors working together, they can best solve crime problems. It started in 1990 out of Portland. So many good things come out of Portland. Good coffee, good salmon, community prosecution. And back in the 1990s, the local businesses were concerned about quality of life crimes actually impeding local business development. So they went to the community, they went to the local DA's office and they started the first ever neighborhood DA unit. See how good that is? Now, um, back when I was a prosecutor, like I said, I had no idea what community prosecution was. But most prose community prosecution initiatives deploy prosecutors out into the community to work with citizens to identify the needs and then come up with solutions. Now, I didn't learn how to do this from any classroom, any courtroom, or any boardroom. I learned how to do this from one person, and that was my mom. She was so good at this. Living room's dirty, deploy Debbie. Dog needs to get fed, deploy Debbie. Milk's dangerously low in the fridge, deploy Debbie. I remember this one day in particular. I was standing in my kitchen watching my dad walk out the back door of our house with a small overnight bag he was holding, never to return again. Earlier that day, my parents had told my sister and I that they were getting a divorce. I was 12 and relieved. It was finally over. The abuse, the drinking, the screams to call police. My mom walked back towards me, put her hand on my shoulder, took a, dip, be, a big deep breath, <sighs> looked me right in the eyes and said, Debbie, we really need an attorney in the family. <laughs> See how good she was? Getting a divorce? Deploy Debbie. <laughs> now looking back, my mom did not intend for me to become an attorney by her comment, but from that day on, it was the only thing I ever wanted to do, to become an attorney to help my mom. I just didn't realize how difficult it was going to be. And I'm not talking about passing any sort of school exam, bar exam, or background exam. I'm talking about examining my past. Because when you're deployed out into the community, it's like a military zone. Kids are fighting wars in their heads and their hearts all alone. They're facing trauma in their schools, in the streets, and in their homes. And when you're deployed out to that, it can trigger your own traumas, like PTSD. They didn't realize back then the effects of chronic trauma on children. In fact, a lot of people making the most important decisions for kids, whether they're suspensions, expulsions, incarceration, or prosecution, back then as well as today, are not trained on trauma. Kids that are facing trauma are more likely to become involved in drugs and alcohol, getting kicked out of school, criminal activity, unhealthy relationships, and teen pregnancy. By the time I was a senior in high school, my sister and I had all of these checked off of our list. 
got involved in drugs and alcohol, dropped out of school, unhealthy relationships, criminal activity, and when my sister came home, midway through her first year of college, 19 and pregnant, we got the last one, teen pregnancy. Now, I remember sitting across the nun from my expulsion hearing, and she looked at my mom and I and asked, what is wrong with you? Looking back, the better question would have been, what happened to you? What happened to me is that I went on to graduate high school, college, and law school. I've been a county prosecutor for 12 years. My mom got her attorney in the family. Now, my story may seem unique, but it's not. 35 million children are faced with trauma today, and they will go on to do some amazing things. But many, it'll take a really long time, like Dee Dee. Dee Dee was my elementary school friend growing up. We were similar in so many ways. Same age, same school, faced with the same trauma at home. I remember pulling up to Dee Dee's apartment to carpool. She came outside, argued with her mom, went back inside, and her mom waved us to go on without her. That would happen over and over and over again. Dee Dee missed so much school. Everyone used to ask, what is wrong with Dee Dee? The better question, looking back, would have been, what happened to Dee Dee? Because what happened to Dee Dee is before she was able to rebuild her life into her 30s, she lost everything. Her job, her home, her kids. Dee Dee's story is not unique. One out of five children in California are truant. And the ratios are even high for kids of color, low income, homeless, foster youth, and special ed. Over 230,000 students in California right now are at risk for falling behind in school. The only difference between Dee Dee and I was that I had positive role models, an emphasis on education, and after school activities. I loved my basketball, ballet folklorico, and my bicycle. Dee Dee had no idea how to even ride a bike. Now, we have known for quite some time, which I believe, that if we provide the kids with the right perspective, the tools, and the framework to succeed, that they can change anything in their life. The research has told us this for quite some time, but for some reason, this country has not had an unwavering commitment to help our children succeed. And I find this perplexing, because just in the last four years, California has lost $4.5 billion dollars in absenteeism. That could have taken 12 of us to the moon. Riverside County has a 25.06% truancy rate and loses $96 million a year in absenteeism. That can pay for tuition and housing for every single undergraduate student here at La Sierra University. Every year. See how good I am at identifying our needs? <laughs> there are some leaders in this community, though, that say, it's not our problem, it's not our job to fix, it's the parents. But what they don't realize is that oftentimes these parents are adult children of trauma. 60% of adults today report having faced childhood trauma, so to ask them to provide the correct tools and framework for our children to succeed is like asking the sun to leave the sky, or asking a baby to stop crying, it's just impossible. We know that it takes 100 years to raise a child. Our parent, we learn from our parents just like our parents learn from theirs. Like my nana. My mother grew up in a traditional Mexican-American home with one person that dominated it, and that was the matriarch, my grandmother, Nana. Now, Nana was strict, stubborn, and stern. It was her way or no way. Nana had immigrated from Guadalajara, Mexico when she was eight, when her grandfather rescued her from the orphanage that her mom abandoned her in. That abandonment from her mom shaped her vision and view of the world as well as her treatment of my mother. Nana was a woman of God. She would say the rosary every night and remind us every night that we didn't. <laughs> I remember being at my eighth grade confirmation party and my nana went to put up her champagne glass in the air to say a toast with everyone watching. She looks right at me, and she says, Debbie, we really need a nun in the family. <laughs> I'm 13. I just discovered boys. I just discovered how to ditch school, not get caught. I just discovered the flavor of alcohol. 
a nun. I remember hearing one of the boys at the party say, that would be a sin if Debbie became a nun. (laughs) There's so many similarities, though, between becoming a prosecutor and a nun, especially in dating. When I talk to guys and tell them I'm a prosecutor, it feels like we're in a confessional because they have to tell me every single thing they've ever done wrong. (laughs) Or I get these responses, whoa, I'm not okay with the police. Or have you ever convicted anyone innocent? Or the one I like the most, you don't really think OJ did it, do you? (laughs) I just stopped telling guys that I was a prosecutor. I just tell them I'm a stay-at-home mom. I don't even have any kids. <laughs> I guess my Nana did get her nun. <laughs> Nana was a good woman. She passed away when she was 98. And she used to sew my sister and I matching dresses for every holiday. She would cut me mint leaves from the garden and put them in hot water to make me tea when my stomach hurt. And she used to make her, fresh, her, her dog, John John, fresh dog food every day. She used to show my sister and I the wonders of L.A. on the RTD bus system, all the way from the Santa Monica Pier to the La Brea Tar Pits to Chinatown. Nana gave me a sense of hope that I needed in order to see beyond my circumstances at home. Back in 2010, I left the gang unit to do what Nana had done for me. I wanted to give kids a new perspective. I remember some of the responses from my colleagues, like Keith. Keith is a prominent defense attorney. And he tells me, how does a homicide DA go to to social worker? Don't get me wrong, he says. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, but what does this do for your career? Understand that back when I was in the gang unit, reputations and promotions were based on trial stats. I had done 40 jury trials five of which resulted in life without possibility of parole sentences for kids under 21. I had won top prosecutor of the year in the county twice and had won the Bulldog Stick It To Him Award, too. I was going to be the next Marsha Clark. But there came a time I began to realize that each of us has a responsibility to understand where our work fits in on a broader spectrum in this world to make it a better place. The pivotal moment for me when I was listening to a jail call by this hardcore gang member, Nemo. The gang members in my case, they had monikers that were always right on point. Midget, he was five feet tall. Goofy, he had this big smile. Nemo, he had big eyes, big lips. (laughs) Nemo was on the jail call talking to his younger brother, and he said, stop ditching school, stop smoking marijuana, Stop trying to join the gang. Something inside of me clicked. We had to do something that saved Nemo's brother. I kept seeing this over and over again in the cases that I was doing. No positive role models, no emphasis on education, no after-school activities. So when I went out to the community, I was sitting, standing in the living room of an at-risk kid. His brother looks at the gang cop and I sit standing next to me and says, you guys really got to find something for these kids to do after school. I kept hearing this over and over again. So I went to my now boss's office, Jerry, and I told him what I was hearing. And he said, you know what? You really need to start a program for girls because those gang members usually leave the gang because of a girl. He says, you know what? Where the girls go, the boys will follow. (laughs) Ever since then, I've been trying to do some things to help young women. One of the ways was starting Women Wonder Writers because I knew if I was going to do this social work, that I had to do something that fueled my authentic passion. And for me, that was writing. At the time, I was writing my first legal thriller called The Mama Sita Murders. And I also had always journaled in diaries growing up. I wrote my very first poem called Authentic Self that goes like this. Mirror, mirror on the wall, who am I after all? Before life sets in and pressures begin, violence on the street, sleeping on concrete, Trying to fit in amongst a world of sin, drugs and alcohol consumption, family dysfunction. Mirror, mirror on the wall, show me my authentic self, the person underneath it all. 
Back in 2011, we piloted our first program with five young women on the east side of Riverside, which was affected by gangs and drugs. We provided them positive role models, an emphasis on education, and after-school activities, which was a cultural arts and writing program called the Right of Your Life. And we began to see the results, like Andrea. Andrea reminded me so much of myself. She had dropped out of school, low self-esteem, and unhealthy relationships. She was able to graduate from the right of your life twice. Then she went on to become a program leader. And then she went on to finish high school at a local charter school called Gateway College and Career Academy that came out of Portland. See, another good thing about Portland? Since 2011, we've served over 200 young women in after-school programs every single year. We've grown into an independent, nonprofit organization that partners with public and private entities and even local universities. Just this past year, we started our first youth court and served over 40 students who were facing harsh penalties in juvenile court or the school discipline office. Now, since 2011, Juvenile court filings in Riverside County have gone down each and every year and continue to go down. Now, I can't take full credit for this because many other things have followed Women Wonder Writers. For example, Mike, the newly elected district attorney, encourages every single prosecutor to go out into the community and volunteer. Hunter, a district attorney, created Real Men Read, a literacy program for young men that's in every single juvenile hall right now in the county. And Luigi, a DA, started Board Kids, an after-school board game activity at local community centers. My boss, Jerry, was right. Where the girls go, the boys will follow. <laughs> there are some leaders in this community that still believe that our priorities should be on detention, incarceration, and prosecution, instead of prevention, intervention, and rehabilitation. And I find this perplexing because what I know is that to deter a youth from incarceration for one year will save us $180,000 in incarceration costs for that year. I also know that if we prevent a teen from adopting a life of crime, it'll save between $1.7 and $2.3 million for each youth. If this county and this country wants and expects to be a leader, it cannot stay behind in the race to dismantle the school-to-prison pipeline. We must become trauma-informed. We must reduce chronic absenteeism. And we must correct the disparities that still exist in our juvenile justice and education systems. I am not suggesting that we abandon or suspend accountability for our kids. But I am suggesting that we stop asking them what's wrong with them, we stop expecting parents to do the impossible, and we start leveraging every single resource that we have, including our own authentic passions, to help these kids so that they can succeed, like Carissa. Carissa was one of the first girls that I mentored. And I remember sitting across from her at dinner, and she said, will you take me to go see my dad? I said, Carissa, what's your dad going to think of me taking you to state prison to visit him? I'm a prosecutor. He's a gang member. We convicted him. She looks at me and says, he'd be cool with it. You know why? Because you helped me stay out of prison. I'm going to leave you with my version of a quote from Abraham Lincoln. Now, he wasn't a Virgo, he wasn't a prosecutor, and he wasn't a woman. But he did believe only he has a right to criticize who has a heart to help. As your community prosecutor, I believe that only he or she has a right to incarcerate who has a heart to help. Thank you for letting me share. Thank <laughs> you.